This is In Focus. I'm John Lieberman, joined by two very special guests today. First, we have Stefan Odefer, the founder and managing director of 42. It's a really neat Munich-based startup that actually uses eye tracking technology and AI so that people can interact with computers with their eyes instead of their hands. So we'll get to Stefan in just a second. We also have our own David Judge, Vice President of SAP Intelligent Enterprise Solutions. He's gonna to talk to us about machine learning and, and AI and how those two put together can, can help businesses. So let's jump right in guys. Uh, Stefan, can you tell me first a little bit about 42? What is this idea of gaze control? Sure, thank you. So basically what we're doing for more than 50 years now is to be using the mouse to control our devices, right? If this is a mouse, externally mouse, or like I do have here, which is a more ergonomic version of the mouse or the touchpad, but it didn't really change for the last 50 years. And by the way, the keyboard is more than 200 years old. So actually today's latest technology we're controlling and operating with a rather outdated uh, technology. And that's what we, why we use uh, eye tracking for controlling a computer. Because eye tracking for the first time in history, it allows you to do two things. It controlling a computer and it under, we can use a understanding what the user actually wants to predict and uh, his intention. And by, by this, we can support him in a proactive way. So for example, it scrolls automatically while you're reading a text or if you're in a sub uh, environment, you, you look at a form input field and it directly selects this field so you don't need to hand, uh, leave your hands from the keyboard to the mouse and back to just click a field. That is really, really interesting. And you know, we're talking about different ways to kind of get back to our daily life. I don't want to use the word normal, but our, our daily life. So give me some examples, because I also know you were a part of the SAP IO Foundry and that SAP is a customer. Give us some, some examples of, of how we're gonna be able to hopefully get back to uh, some semblance of normal. Sure, so right, we've been part of the uh, summer batch in 2018 in, in, the, in the Berlin uh, foundry of uh, SAP.io. And in, in, during this time, we uh, made contact to colleagues of yours, uh, for example, to the shop floor, uh, where it's about to basically use your hands for the actual work that you're doing. So you're doing a quality assurance, you're doing assembly, et cetera. And what you do there even more and more is that you confirm steps, that you look up things because if you reduce the number of parts that uh, or individualized parts, then you, you need to interact with your device more often. And when you can have your hands for the actual tasks that you do, and you don't need to use your hands to, to just touch a, and confirm a button or something. Um, that's obviously more efficient. And in, in during Corona times, it's also more healthy. So because if you have different shifts of workers and you would always need to um, sterilize the touch screen so to make sure that you don't transmit germs on this touch screen. And it's not only on, on the shop floor, it's also obviously in other environments such as health environments where you um, have a, uh, a higher risk of infection as more infected people are in this, in, in, in this area. So controlling a touchscreen device with your gaze to select where you, or what element you want to interact with. Yeah, and I know, David, you're in New York. Imagine if you could just use you know, gaze control to get on the subway instead of having to swipe your card or, or touch your card, you know? How much that would help with safety and health and, and getting us back to work quicker. Yeah, I think the fascinating thing about many of the technologies, even for example, with what 42 is doing, uh, we can actually uh, lower the friction of people's interactions with these devices or with these systems while at the same time making them safer and faster. So I think one of the fascinating things about with the present situation that we find ourselves in right now is, is that we're in some ways uh, speeding up our step into some of these technologies and into uh, new ways of interacting either with each other or with buildings or with other systems uh, because of the need that the crisis has caused. So I'm, I, I would, yes, I would love to be able to get onto the subway right now, first of all, but I would also love to not have to have to swipe a card. Yeah, but David, you bring up a really good point, which is, you know, we hear the buzzwords, AI, machine learning, 
blockchain companies are prototyping these things, but they're really not, in terms of mainstream adoption, it's really not there yet. So is this going to be, COVID-19 and, and this pandemic, is this going to be what kind of pushes these technologies into the mainstream? Uh, for some of them, I think that it will. Uh, but I think there's a, a huge push right now towards uh, resilience, which seems to be the topic of the day, either within the massive disruptions within supply chains or disruptions in the way and how we're working. I mean, just look, we're, we're talking through video conference right now, and there's a little algorithm running around me, which is uh, replacing my kid's playroom, which you can't see right now, with a background. So there's, there's, there's lots of interesting uh, sort of uh, applications of these technologies, which are now being thought of in a new way uh, with maybe a bit more urgency. So no longer is it really about, um, you know, sort of around the edges of maybe I want to improve just a little bit with the experience. Now I have to rethink my entire customer experience because I can no longer service them in the same way as I was. So, you know, just take, for example, um, a sporting venue. Uh, they're closed for business right now. And when they open, we're going to need to find new ways uh, uh, for people to enjoy such a public experience. And to do so, we're going to have to have either new, uh, basically new procedures, sure. But we're also going to need to have new uh, sensors, new ways of tracking people's movements throughout that, that experience, which many companies wanted to do before anyway. But now we have this sort of compelling event of to even open up a stadium, we need to rethink how we interact with that environment and thus the technology that supports that interaction. Yeah, that's a really good point. And Stefan, let me bring you back in. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, how intelligent technologies can kind of help society move from crisis to recovery. So, for example, you know, people's health data, virus test results. Um, are these things going to be stored in the blockchain? What are you hearing from customers and people that you interact with? Well, from, from our customers, uh, first of all, they are looking to, uh, you know, coming back from still in home office, but coming back more and more, they need to make sure that uh, they are safe in, uh, in the environments they're working on. And this technology, I agree with David, so the, this technology helps. And I, I'm pretty sure that there will be more uh, budgets going into these areas because uh, like the budget that we have seen for years, for the next 10 years, going to be squeezed down in digitization especially in, in these companies that have seen that they're not at the pace that other companies are and, and, and it's, uh, they need to do so basically. So um, regarding this uh, data and, and, and the health issues, um, well, I think most of these, uh, uh, this data and for example, we are using an eye tracking, we are using a lot of data and that's, uh, that's private data. So um, that is, it's very important that you keep this data in control of the user. I mean, we are in the in European Union, we have a, uh, even a different uh, uh, view on, on privacy here, uh, a more severe view on privacy. Um, so for us, this is something that we basically uh, increased by design already in, in, the, in the architectural release of the software. And David, finally, when you think of the next year, the next 12 months, what do you think we're going to see bottom line in terms of machine learning and AI usage? I think we'll see adoption that will help uh, people do, do either one of two things, probably both of these two things. First, it's going to be used to help make the transition um, uh, from existing business models to future business models. Uh, we'll have to think about how we run businesses and particularly just think alone of the disruption that's happened within things like call and contact centers where the wait times for some very large companies are now in the hours because they've had major disruptions from the people that would normally sit very close together and answer those phone calls. So finding ways to do that in a more intelligent way is going to be, I think, a huge focus. And the number two is uh, from the bottom up uh, towards that process, using data uh, that businesses already have in their, on their operation side to make more intelligent decisions more quickly. So um, an, an analysis end of this, uh, and then one where we're actually trying to automate um, and sort of uh, speed the execution of some human driven tasks. Both of those two things, are you just gonna throw gas on the fire with both of them. Everyone's going to be trying to do this. Interesting times for sure. Stefan, best of luck to you, stay safe. 
David, thank you very much for your insights. Stay safe. And uh, we'll talk to you guys again soon. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you.